All right, so we looked on control structures and we said that there are three ways by which we can um, lay out our algorithms. We have sequence, which is your basic input processing output. We have selection, which is um, decision making. Then now we are going to move on to the third and final, which is loops. All right. So what is it we're going to cover today? We're covering, so we're going to describe what are iterations. So you'll hear me saying iterations are loops, it's the same thing. Um, and we're going to look on how to use iterations in algorithms. So repetition or loop. So this is where one or more steps is performed repeatedly. Um, so um, in one of our videos, I did say that if it is that we're going to find the sum of 100 numbers, it would make no sense or it would be time consuming for you to declare 100 different variables. It would be 101, 101 different variables for you to come up with this solution, right? So the processing aspect of, our, of any computer system can take on the task of looping repetition which means that one particular step is done over and over and over again it's like you your your life on a daily basis while there are some aspects that change most of it remain the same so every single day is that you would be a part of this loop going to school being the the most prominent example all right so there are two types of loops we have bounded iteration and we have unbounded iteration. And we're going to look on each, but we are going to focus now on bounded. Good? So repetition is basically where you have one or more steps that are being that are repeated. Good. So bounded iteration now. Basically, once it is you have questions and it will not tell you how many times your program is supposed to loop what it will tell you is that it should stop if a value is entered good now for your bounded iteration you will know how many times your program is going to loop example find the sum of the first 100 numbers in the number system good we know that this is going to loop a hundred times because it is asking us to enter to find the sum of 100 numbers if i ask you to find the sum of the numbers in the numeral system and the program is supposed to terminate when 999 is entered you don't know how many times that program will loop because you don't know which user will enter 999. But for sure, if I say to find the sum of 100 numbers, then you know for sure it is 100 times that it is going to loop. Good? If I ask you something for the days of the week, then you know that it's going to loop seven times. So once it is that you are given a number which tells you how many times your program is going to loop, it means that you're looking on bounded iteration. All right, so example, 10 times or 15 times. So this type of iteration, which is bounded, bounded iteration uses a for construct, good? So once it is that you know how many times your, program, um, your algorithm is supposed to loop, you're going to use a for. That's how CX is structured. So once it is that you know that it is supposed to loop 12 times, use a for loop. That is what they're looking for in terms of their mark scale. While you can use a different type of loop, they are looking exactly for you to use a for. All right, so how is it that our for construct is um, 
made up? How it, what's the layout of it? So the first thing you're going to have is the word for, followed by your variable name, your starting figure, and your end figure. And we use the word to. So for variable name equal beginning one or zero to 12, seven, whichever the end number is, do. Good? Then now the instructions to be repeated will come within the for block, indented away again. Once it is that you have your for, you must have your end for. And it's not like the nested if where you're going to have a for within a for, and you need to nest it and have multiple end for. No, we don't normally. We, it's not that technical at this stage. So it's just one for loop that you'll have. Good? All right, example now. So for day, days in the month. So for day equal, so day would be our variable name. For would be our keyword. And then our starting figure is 1 to 30 do. This algorithm would loop 30 different times. Next example, for miles equal 10 to 100 do. So we're not always going to start at one. We're not always going to start at zero. You can start at whatever figure you want. In this case, like the four, first one, you could also have four day equal 30 to one. So you can start at the highest figure and you have increment and decrement. So it depends on what you want to do. Four hours equal one to 24, yes. So here, write an algorithm to calculate and print the average score for each student in a class of 25. Each student was given three grades, three tests, three graded pieces, same thing. Each student was given three tests, so we're going to use the three tests to calculate the average, but we must do this for 25 students, which now means that we know how many times our program is going to loop. It's going to loop, loop 25 times. Good? So, when it is that you are doing any type of loop, right, we're going to implement three steps, right? So, step one, write the algorithm without the loop. So we would look basically on the sequence part of it. So here, what you would write is that you would write the regular algorithm, which is going to accept the grade. So you would ignore the fact that you are accepting it for 25 persons and write it as though you were going to do this for one person only. So you would accept the three grades, calculate the average, output the average, good. Then now at step two, you implement the loop. Oh. So you look on the algorithm and you see where, which part of the algorithm is supposed to loop, right? Then you would put your four constructs there. Then step three is to close the loop and output data. So you can output within the loop or you can output outside of the loop. It depends on what the question is asking. So if it, if it is asking for the class average, then what you would do is that you would output outside of the loop. Good? All right, so solution now. So first one, the first part. So for S, and S is going to stand for student in this case. So for student equal one to 25, and that is step one. That is what we want them to do. So we're going to mark out step one. That is not a part of it. It's just saying that this is the first step that you would do. So for student or S, S stands for student is equal one to 25. What do we want to do? We want to read A, B, C, good. So A, B, C is going to be the first grade, the second grade, the third grade. 
then we're going to calculate sum or you could calculate average instead of calculating sum, it depends. So this is like an easier way. So sum is equal to A plus B plus C, or average is equal to sum divided by three. You could have incorporated what we have here at sum instead of using a new variable, good? Then now we need to output average, so average is average, and then end or for. So this is just an extra, this is not your entire um, algorithm because as you know, the declaration is missing, the name of our algorithm, the start and stop. So this is just the extract for the for section. So as I was saying for step one, is that you would write the algorithm as though you are writing it for one person, which would be for this part. After it is that you write, the algorithm, then you look on the parts that should repeat. What if it is that the, the input part wasn't a part of your loop? Then your for statement would start later on in the algorithm itself. But because it is that we want to loop the entire process, which is asking the user to enter the data, the sum, the average, and then output, then our for construct is going to start at the beginning here. All right, let me see if I can break this up. So normally what you would have is the name of your algorithm, right? So this is going to be average. Let's look on the full thing now. Then you would write your declaration, right? So we have three grades that we want to accept. We have T1, T2, T3. Hope you're following. And then average. Okay, that's all. Because it says that we are to accept, basically accept the three test grades and calculate the average. Moving on to the body, which is start. Good. So we would ask the user now to write the algorithm as though you are writing it for one person or to accept one grade first. Good. So here you would have write, enter three test grades. All right, then now you would have your read statement, which is to store, say so it have read, T1, T2, T3. Good. Moving on now, where we are going to calculate the average. So AVG is equal now, and we say that in the, uh, AVG is, would be equal to T1 plus T2 plus T3, all divided by three to calculate the average. Then now we would output the average. So you would have right, so that's right, average is. That's the text that we want to output. And then our variable name, which is AVG, close bracket, and then we would have stop. So that would be the algorithm without the loop. That is step one. Write the algorithm as though you don't, you are not repeating, you are not looping. Good? Then now, after writing that, because this is what you should be comfortable with, after writing the, 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 the solution without the loop, you look on what is it that you would want to loop. What is it you want to go over 25 different times? Good. So the test grade for bent is going to be the, the is going to be different from the test grade for Aurel. It's going to be different from the test grade for Budu. It's going to be different from the test grade for um, Aji. Good. So you want to repeat this part here, which says right enter three test grade, because you want that aspect of it to change each time. So which means that your loop is going to go right above. 
So right here, I'm going to have a four and I will have what's my variable name. And we're going to look on how is it that we incorporate count as well. Good. So we're going to add a new variable, which is name student. This is going to track now the number of students in the class. This is what we call a counter. Good. So for S, and S is going to ensure that we don't pass 25. So S is equal to 1, 2, Twenty-five do. Good. So that is what we want to repeat twenty-five different times. Are we clear? Then now, where it is that our loop is supposed to end, we're going to have our end for. We never leave no space. So I'm going to go patched up right here. So end for. All right, it would come above your stop right here. Right. So that now would be the solution right there. So the, what, what the, the purpose of the counter is to ensure that you don't go over the 25. Once it is that you have a loop, you must have a counter, which is going to track how many times the program is supposed to loop. You're supposed to also increment the counter, but we'll look on that on Monday. Incrementing and decrementing our counter. All right, so let's look on another example. Write an algorithm which reads a number that represents the number of students who took an exam. The algorithm should count the number of students who passed and the number of students who failed. So this now is going to take in, within our looping structure, we are going to have an if statement. So the algorithm should count the number of students who passed and the number of students who failed. The pass mark is 60. We're going to use an if then construct here because we have two conditions, whether it is that you pass or fail. It says that you're to output the number of persons who passed and the number of persons who failed, then the number of students. All right, guys. Let's get into this. All right, so I just changed the application that I was using so that you can follow better. Okay, miss. Now, based on what we have been looking on in the previous classes um, on algorithm, we're going to write the full algorithm for this question. All right, so it says write an algorithm which reads a number that represents the number of students who took an exam. So this part is going to determine how many times your program loops. So in the other questions, you would have been given um, an amount or the, the number of times your program is supposed to loop. In this case, it is asking you to get that number from the user, whoever is going to enter the value. Good. Then it says now the algorithm should count the number of persons that so we have here, count the number of students who passed and it should also count the number of students who failed. And it gives the pass mark for the test. It says that you're to output the number of persons who passed, the number of persons who failed, and the number of students who took the exam. So basically, took the exam. So basically, we are outputting 
the calculations here, which is failed and passed. And we're also going to output this now that the user entered. Now we know that the first thing that we should have is the name of our algorithm. Ready? So we're going to give our algorithm a name. So I had examination as the name of the algorithm. All right. So after the name of our algorithm now, we want to have our declaration. So basically what we're going to have is the variables that we want to use. So here, let's, let's, let's check now. What is it that we need? So we need to accept a number which represents the number of students. So let's have num student or num stu. And this is going to represent the number of students who is in the class or who would have taken the exam. What I was saying is that it's just like um, if you're to write this program for the classes at Monroe, the numbers would vary because not all classes are equal, which means that um, persons, different class have different size or different numbers in there. Yeah, vary. All right, so that's the first part. The algorithm should count the number of students who passed. So we are going to have pass, because we need to check that. So that's pass. And we need to check the number of students who failed. The pass mark is 60. We don't need a variable name for that. It says that we are to output all of that. Um, so we have the three variables that we need to output. We're going to add one more variable because what we're saying is that for each value, each time it moves from one to our next loop, we want something to be checking so that it doesn't pass whatever the user enter here, which is numstu. And I'm going to use count because that is what it is doing. It is counting. All right. So somebody was asking about the counter section. All right, so let me put a box right here. Well, this doesn't give me the option to do much. All right, so let me put one, two, three, and All right, so guys, for the, the person who said that they didn't understand, I think it was Matthew, the count section, right? Once it is that, your, let's say the user entered that they have five students in their class. The purpose of the counter is to move incrementally from here, which is at one, to five. So what the counter, when we start at the beginning, we give the counter a value. So let me move to that part. So we're going to have now start. So we're now at the body section. So we take our variable, which is count, and we give it a starting value. Normally we start with zero, but because we're at the introductory phase where persons don't count from zero, we're going to start at one. So we put one. So count is equal to one. All right. Here. So when we give it the, the starting value, which is one, once it is that it accepts the first grade, we are going to change it now from one to two. And I'm going to show you how we change it from, from one to two. Then after it moves to two, which is to accept the second grade, and it, and it does whatever it is in the loop, it is supposed to move to three. After it moves to three, it is going to carry out the instructions in the loop and then increment to four. Once it increments to four and reach to five, it is going to carry out the instructions in the loop and stop because there is no six. 
So that is the purpose of the counter. It is to count how many entries are made so that it does not surpass the number of times the program is supposed to loop. I hope that um, you understand from that perspective. Pass is equal to zero. Why zero? We are yet to do anything in our algorithm. So currently, we have zero persons who would have passed. And in the same way, we have zero persons who would uh, have failed. So at this point in time where nothing has happened, or pass is zero or failed is zero. But our count is at one because that is what we are starting at. And as I said before, we could have started with zero, but that will come later on. So here now it is asking that we ask the user to enter how many students took an, the exam. So let's give that instruction now to the user. So we're going to have write, and this is to indicate that this now is some form of output instruction. So we are going to have write, enter, ooh, what is that? All right, so that's our instruction now. So once this is outputted, we need a, a variable which we will use to store what the user enter in. And that is where our read statement comes in. So we have read, and we're going to have this variable here, which we already declared that that is what we are using now to hold the number of students. So we have num underscore stu. Good. So this now will determine how many times our program loop. So if the user enter five, if the user enter 20, if the user enter 40, the program, the algorithm, sorry, is going to loop 40 times. All right, the program itself, because it's what we are going to transition. We're going to transition into program writing. All right, so here now we need to have our looping structure. So we're going to have for or count to variable because that is what is checking how many times the program should loop um, and ensuring that it doesn't exceed its maximum value. So for count is equal to the starting value that you have here, which is one, two, and we're going to use numstu because we don't know how many times offhand to put a value there. So instead of putting 30, 40, or 15, like in the other cases, we're going to put the variable name. So whatever is stored in the variable, that is how many times the program will loop. So, so for call equal, this in brackets. So that's our structure right there. Do. What do we want to happen? We want to accept the grade. Let me go back up. So the algorithm should count the number of persons who passed, the number of persons who failed. So we didn't store a variable for the grade, so we're going to add the variable there because we must check mark to find out if it is that the grade mm -hmm. is greater than or less than 60. So let's add mark here. Good. So now we want the user to enter mark. Mm -hmm. We're going to have right again. Good. Then now we are going to store that in the variable called mark. 
here, we are going to have our if statement now. So we enter the mark, but what we are really checking for is whether the person's passed or failed. So we need to check if the grade is greater than or equal to 60 so that we know the pass mark is 60. So it's greater than or equal to 60. That will determine the number of persons who pass. If the mark is less than 60, it basically means that the person would have failed the exam. So we're going to have if statement now. So if mark is greater than or equal to 60, then we want to increase pass because no, we have a mark. We have a mark, which is right here, right here. So now we can increase these two numbers depending on the mark. So what you do is that each time it loop, if it meets the condition, you add one to it because you're just checking one grade. You can't do everything. It's not wholesome. So you can just accept all the marks and then run it through the if statement. It's going to check one at a time. So here now, pass is equal to pass. And right here, this pass is the starting value. So we had zero. So it's equal to zero plus one. Else, because if you don't pass, you fail. So we have now fail is equal to fail, which is zero plus one. And then we have our ending. Good. Now, after the end if no, all of that would have been completed. We need to increase our counter so that now it moves from one to two. All right, so what you do now is the same thing. Count is equal to count plus one. And then we have our N4. So after it would have looped the number of times that was entered here, we need to output this, we need to output mark, and we need, no, we need to output the number of students who did the exam, the number of persons who passed, and the number of persons who failed. So we're going to have right, and then you would have number that passed, um, that would be pass. And then now we close our algorithm with stop. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's see if we can look at it as a whole. Probably still don't fit everything on the page. All right, good. So let's run through now, guys. Let's do a trace. We're going to move to trace table, but let's do a trace so that we can understand what it is saying. Mm -hmm. All right. So here we have count equal one, pass equal zero, fail equal zero. Enter the number of students that took the exam. Let's say that the user entered five. So let's put five right here. We're just checking. Let's say that the user entered five. Good. It says now we would move to our loop structure. For count equal one to five. 
so five would come right oh, let me move it right above so for count equal one to five do so that is the purpose of this this is now going to tell us how many time our program should loop now it says now enter the mark received so let's say now that the person entered 70 here so that's the mark it says now if mark which is 70 let me put it over there so basically what it is saying if 70 is greater than or equal to 60 and here it is it is clearly greater than it's not equal it is greater than so this condition is true so pass which is the variable is now equal to pass which was previously set to zero so put zero right here plus one so at this point pass is going to change from one right from zero right there to one that will be its new value good now because the person did not fail it would skip this part here because it met the first condition so it's going to move outside of the if and it is going to move now to the counter section so count is equal to one because that's our starting value at the top one plus one so what is going to happen now count at this point is going to move to two right there so that it the program will continue to loop so it's not going to move outside of the n4 because it the condition right here at the 4 is still true you move outside of the 4 when the condition becomes false so count is equal to 1 to 5 we are still not at 5 so because it is now at 2 it is going to go again so what is going to happen it's going to come back right here at mark received so it's going to ask the user enter the mark received so let's say this time now the person entered 55 so right here this oops and then we can get to edit this so this now will change to 55 so if 55 is greater than or equal to 60 and it is clear now that 55 is not greater than 60 so this condition would not be true so it's going to skip the pass section and move to the else because if you're not pass, you must fail. Mm. So then now, fail is going to be equal to fail, which we have at the top at zero, zero plus one. So the value here at fail is now changed to one. Good? Now the for structure is still true. The condition is still true because when it moves to that section what is going to happen is that this no i know you know i change right here is going to change from one to two so two count is at two i could check and ensure see there the last value count is at two so count is equal to count plus one so count is now equal to two plus one which is now three so we're going to put three right there so the value would incrementally change that's the purpose of count so the condition is still true because we are not at five good so we entered one value that's one time two value so we are now on our third loop so on our third loop now the user entered um let's say 60 in this case so this part is going to change now to 60. So 60 is equal to 60. It's not greater than, it's just equal to. So pass is going to change. So here, no, zero more. Uh -uh. Not it. Hold on. 
edit this zero. Let me edit this. Okay. So pass is now equal to one plus one because it, the last value for pass is one. So it's going to increment now to two. All right? So now that pass is at two, it's not going to move down to fail because that condition mm -hmm. is true. What is going to happen now is that count is going to change. So count is now equal to three plus one. So now, did I change the value for pass? So now count is going to be equal to four. Good? The for loop is still true because the, condi the, the, the condition here, we're still not at five. So we come again and we ask the user to enter a next value. The next value now is going to be, let's say a next fail. Mm, so let's say the person got 35. So here we are going to change um, so here now, Mark is at 35. Where my if statement gone? Well, somehow I deleted the if statement that was there. So let me put it back. Yeah. All right. So now Mark is at 35. So pass will not increase because this condition is false. So we would move to fail. So fail is now going to be one. One plus one. So fail is going to increment now to two. And you see how the numbers come into play because we have five. We would have entered one, two, three, four values. So we have two pass, two fail. So it must add up in the end. All right? So now count is going to increment. So count is now at four. Four plus one, which is five. So here now, count is going to move to five. And it is going to check. So the condition is still true because it is at five. So it's going to ask for a next value. So this person now get 96. So 96 would, the 35 here would be replaced by 96. 96 is indeed greater than 60. So it means that this condition is true. So this one would now change to two because pass is at two. So pass is equal to two plus one, which is three. Good. It would not check the fail section, as I said before, because it already meet this condition. So it's not going to go any further. So we are going to increment count now. So count now would move from four to five. Oh, five. So count is equal to five plus one, which is now six. six. Seven. The condition is seven. false because we did say for count equal one to five. So it is not going to go in our loop. It's going to go outside of the loop now and it's going to output the number that passed. And because we have three at the top, three would come here instead of the word pass at the end here. Because we have two, two that failed, it would replace the word right here because that is what is stored in the variable. So two would be there. And instead of numstu, what you would have right here is five. So what you would see on the screen, number that passed, three. Number that failed, two. Total number that took the exam, five.